Joining us now to review some of the headlines of today's newspapers from around the world is a Rice News analyst, Emmanuel Efeni. Malabite, good morning. Good morning, Ruben. Good morning, Rufa. Good, good morning, morning Victoria Tundu, MQ, and Viola. Good morning. Yes. Well, Erga uh, 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 yes. before you go on, yes. have you noticed something special about Tundu this morning? Oh, my God. That's She's uh, proclaiming that Jesus is Lord with the crucifix. <laughs> All day, every day. Well, she's a, div she's a devout Christian. Yeah. So let's leave it at that. Yeah. And uh, you can proclaim your religion as long as you don't infringe another person's freedom of religion. So, Tundu, I'm, o I'm okay with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> now, we we'll start the review with this day, Nigeria's newspaper of records. The lead story. Southern presidency gathers momentum as autumn middle belt endorses demand. Lawmakers from South back governors. ACF, we can't dictate to parties. Northern elders rebuff zoning. Yes, the rightly so. The Southern governors made their stand yesterday based on what, of course, is a gentleman agreement. It's not written anywhere in the Constitution. We all know that, for those referring us back to the Constitution. But if power has been in the North for eight years by 2023, as these elders, Northern elders, saying that power will continue to remain in that zone, Yes, we know that no one zone can win the presidential election on its own based on constitutional provision of spread. That is why politicians must also judge all in this, um, in this drive to ensure that the next president comes from the South. It is not a matter of force, but I think the Northern elders should not look at it as if there is an impos imposition that is extra constitutional. No. This in itself is an agreement amongst politicians. And if anybody is trying to deny that now, because we recall when some politicians were hounding Ruben, your boss, that you are taking our turn, I don't know which concern they were talking about based on the fact that former president Tolushego and Basanjo has done eight years, Yaradwa, Umar Yaradwa, came from the north. And because he died in office, and of course the rest story is history, that was why some people were clamoring that no, Jonathan should not go for a second term because he would be denying them their turn. So I think we still need to talk Jojo about this, but I think the direction is, um, is just what it should be. The momentum that the next president should come from the South. I don't think any uh, politician who wants the unity and stability of this country should be arguing with that position. Ruben, Rufai, and Tundu, I want your take on this before we move on to other stories. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Afeni. My take on this is let us be serious and let us be honest and let us be truthful with ourselves when we have issues like this in the country. Because when we are not truthful, then we walk the path of injustice. And when we walk the path of injustice, we have instability in the land. It is so easy, you know, for any group in the North to say quickly that political parties make these decisions. But the truth is, we have always zoned one way or the other in the spirit of fairness and equity. I'll go back to 79. The two key political parties deliberately, deliberately made their vice presidential candidate come from the East. Philip Umedi and uh, Alex Ekweme, former architect of blessed memory. It was a deliberate attempt to be able to placate those demands back in the days and bring forth a sense of inclusion. 
In fact, the third person on that ballot that didn't have a, a vice presidential candidate from the East was Nnamdi Azikiwe himself, because obviously he was an Igbo man from the East. So we've always had this arrangement. Let us not deceive ourselves. And it was incumbent on this arrangement that a lot of people did say that, okay, the power should go back to the North. It wasn't in the fact that in 2019, people from the South didn't want to vie for the presidency, but a lot of people had this intuition that it's still the North's time. So let them have it. And it goes back to these agreements they had after eight years that the power will come back to the South. I mean, Chief Oshoba has talked about this agreement a lot in earnest when we interviewed him here. So when is the time for this? Let us not just change everything because, oh, it suits us now. We've always had zoning agreement. Yeah, it's a gentleman's agreement. It's not in the Constitution. The parties decide it. But let us be honest with ourselves. Well, earlier on, Efeni, before you joined us, I made the point that <clears throat> it's not everything <clears throat> excuse me, that is written into the Constitution. Certain things develop by way of convention, by way of tradition, uh, by an attempt to deal with emerging realities within the country, which was what we had uh, in 1998, 1999, when as a result of the crisis occasioned uh, by the uh, annulment of the June 12, 1993 election and the people's subjection to continued military rule, uh, there was that agreement to say, well, this is an aggrieved part of the country. Uh, let us give uh, power to that part of the country. Even if many of those who became beneficiaries uh, were not necessarily involved in the June 12, 1993 uh, uh, process. But what we face many years later is that same old question about the power competition, the competition for power, for space, for resources in Nigeria, whereby you know, there's this proverbial national cake that everybody wants to take uh, a larger share of the cake. This is a familiar uh, metaphor uh, for present company, you know, uh, to the disadvantage <laughs> of other groups within that, uh, uh, with access uh, to that cake. And our concern should be this. Are we ever going to reach a point in this country where it does not matter where you come from? where it does not matter whether you are Igbo or Christian or Yoruba, well, maybe that day will not come in your generation, in my generation, yes. but that should be the ideal. Yes, but the Nigerian until, leadership at all levels. Until we get there, there should be other ways of ensuring fairness. That is why we are talking about Yeah, rotation. Yeah, no, I get your point. But you see, rotational presidency, people will argue is not in the Constitution. That's why I say it's a convention. But in 2023, as I argued earlier, it's not every political party that will follow that convention. You will have political parties out of the over 90 that we have who will bring candidates from all over. And that's why the will of the people, representational participatory democracy, is what is most important in the democratic process. What steps are we taking to ensure that is the will of the people that will prevail? If the Nigerian people can vote in a credible, free, fair election, and they decide that the next president should come from the South-South. That will be their choice. They have the right to go to heaven or hell the way they choose to. But the problem we have is that even in terms of the electoral framework, there is no consensus. And hence, the argument that we've been having, uh, the conversation we've been having earlier today about the framework for elections going forward. Well, for me, it rankles today in particular, as I remember my father on the yeah. 23rd anniversary of his passing. And really, why is he dead? Because the Southerner decided he wanted to be president of this country, and it was decided that, how dare you as a Southerner? So today, of all days, I find it quite triggering, all this nonsense. And Dr. Abati, you are giving me Martin Luther King vibes there, that I have a dream speech. And I do pray once again on this show that one day the president of Nigeria will be, will be about the content of that person's character, not where he's from, what he has to offer Nigerians. These conversations that we're forced to have really are beneath us, and I cannot wait till we move beyond this stage. Yes. And to your point, Dr. Abati, about political conventions, yes, of course, they're not codified, but they're persuasive and in some cases binding and in this case, it ought to be binding. I don't see why, when it's clearly the turn of the South, we start to hear silly excuses. Well, until we get to the idealism that Ruben has been canvassing, we'll still do things by convention to ensure unity, 
fairness and equity in this country. Let's move on to other stories. The Vanguard newspaper, electoral law, PIB, northern groups battle southern governors. Southern rest back governors on power shift, PIB, e-transmission of poll, poll results, others. XACF scribe, false southern governors, you can't stampede not to get presidency, CNG. Pandem backs governors as September 1 timeline on open grazing ban. Only authentic electoral act amendment reports will pass. Bajabia Miller, National Assembly wants to endorse rigging in Nigeria, Middle Belt Forum. We need a truly independent INEC on Hanese. Southwest governors, senators, reps insist on 5% equity for host committees, communities. Senate constitutes seven man, seven member uh, conference committee. Now, the Daily Sun newspaper reps OK bill for state police. Autumn, Southern reps back regions governors on power shift PIB electoral act. Now, the Daily Trust newspaper, Northern elders, Afenifere back reps quest to create state police. Bill passes second reading. You are lagging behind, Northern Groups tells governors. It, it, it will drag us back to colonial era. Tanko Yakasai, Amoteku, Ebubiagu, crude forms of state police, says Ike Ekweremad, former deputy senate president. Now, the, there is a bill already in the National Assembly that has passed first reading, sponsored by a uh, rep member from Akwaibom State. Now, We'll see how that pans out, but let's just look at other uh, papers. Uh, the Nigerian Tribune, Constitutional Review, Southwest Governors Meet Senators' Reps, Fiscal Decentralization, State Police, Top Agenda. Now, um, New Telegraph newspaper, Nigeria still haunted by ghosts of civil war, Pius Ayim explains why wounds refuse to heal, urges country to emulate Rwanda post-war policy. We have saved Nigeria from another civil war, police. Now, below that story, Southern governors, below the photograph, Southern governors, Lagos declaration will be hard to achieve. PDP chieftain, Southern reps, or turn back PIB rotational presidency anti-open grazing laws. Well, now, the Punch newspaper. If any, yes. if any, before you take the Punch newspaper, let's go on a short break. When we return, we'll come back to you. Please stay with us. This isn't the first time we've had to show love to complete strangers. It isn't the first time we've had to help people in need. It isn't the first time we've worn uniforms or the first time we've missed dinner parties or football games. It isn't the first time we've prayed for a miracle, but it may be the first time the world as we know it would change forever. At First Bank, with 126 years of consistent innovative banking under our belt, we have certainly seen a lot of firsts. That's why we've been at the forefront of the support of the COVID relief effort in Nigeria. And now, as we all try to get back to normal and see our loved ones again for the first time in a long time and go back to the places we love and do the things we cherish, let's remember to put safety first because we still have a lot more firsts in us and we know you do too.
Welcome back to the morning show here on the Arise News channel. Still with us is uh, Arise News analyst Emmanuel Efeni, who has been reviewing newspapers uh, and top stories from newspapers from around the world. Efeni, back yes, to you. Yes, let's look at the Punch newspaper. Bandits hold 348 students. UNESCO sounds warning as ACF lampoons federal government. Parents may no longer prioritize <laughs> Education of children, UNESCO warns federal government. We are at the mercy of the federal government, says Governor's aid as 83 federal government college students held. Kaduna Baptist School invaders confirm 121 victims. Demand rise. Others to feed children. I'm very happy that Punch has done this story because I was also losing count of how many children, students, are still languishing in captivity from the various schools that have been attacked and invaded by these bandits. We still remember the children, those little children from Tegina uh, is Islamic School in Niger State, those children are still in captivity, as well as many others. Yet, we are not doing enough. The government, I'm speaking in this case, to get these children out, what will be the fate of parents? Now in Kaduna, 13 schools closed. When those schools were closed, I did not hear of an arrangement for the students of those schools to continue their learning elsewhere. But those schools have been closed. So before long, there will be serious disincentive for parents to send their children to school. And UNESCO is warning, whatever happened to the Safe School Initiative that was launched since the days of President, former President Goodluck Jonathan. Now, let's look at other stories, other newspapers, daily independent newspapers, economic stories. Consumers grown as food prices move up 15% in a month. I am surprised if we are not really in a food crisis. Full-blown right, full, full blown right now, as you can see in the prices of food items, they are out of reach of the common man. Yes, a report today in another newspaper states that in Plateau State alone, food, that is farm products, Crops worth over 1 billion naira have been destroyed by herders and their cattle. So if there is food uh, scarcity, there's high price, we know who to point out to. If you don't deal with the insecurity, of course, we'll continue to have this kind of problem affecting food supply across Nigerian cities. Now, the foreign newspapers quickly, the Guardian newspaper of UK, fears 10 million may face summer isolation as COVID cases surge. Alarm grows over risk of health and economy as restrictions are scrapped. Well, 2 million people could get COVID-19, according to this report, this summer alone, potentially, meaning 10 million isolated in a period of six weeks according to analysis done by the Guardian newspaper of the UK. And Sayid Javid, the health secretary, is saying <clears throat> that Britain is entering uncharted territory as in its wholesale scrapping of lockdown rules. And to that, the Daily Mail is saying isolation insanity. Fury as quarantine rules to last until mid-August, threatening holidays and businesses and ruining plans for up to 3.5 uh, million plan every week. Now, for the Daily Mail, they're more concerned with people's holiday being ruined. But the health secretary has said that <coughs> well, Britain is entering uncharted territory. Efeni, thank yes. you very much. Uh, that's all we'll be able to take. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.